Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to introduce Saral uh, to kick off our roadshow this morning, GDOT and EPD coordinated uh, roadshow. So Haral, I'd like to turn over to you now. So good morning all and welcome to the Rosen Sediment Pollution Control Plan training session this morning. Um, my name is Haral Patel and I'm Director of Engineering with Georgia DOT. So as you know, at GDOT, we promote a culture of collaboration and innovation. So today's session is all about uncovering how can we collaborate better to achieve quality plans. So throughout this session, you will receive information regarding some innovative process changes and tools that can help us successfully submit a good quality plan to EPD. So it goes without saying that multiple reviews are undesirable and it doesn't do good to any of us. Typically, EPD's approval of erosion control plan is the last critical path activity prior to construction NTP. So at that point of project, any delays is just unnecessary burden on our taxpayers. And as we know, I mean, you all like to deliver quality projects on time and under budget. So throughout today's session, you will hear from multiple subject matter experts at GDOT and also directly from EPD. So please pay attention and feel free to ask any questions through the chat box and also share information that you receive today to others that they're not able to join us today. And most importantly, just know that we are a team. If you are when you are working on your erosion control plan and if you have any questions while you're working on your plan, please feel free to contact GDOT mm -hmm. subject matter experts. Also, when you receive comments from EPD and if you need more clarification, please feel free to contact us too. Just remember to collaborate early and continuously so we all can be successful together. So at this time, I would like to introduce our next speaker. She's the state environmental liaison. She's over Georgia DOT's interagency office of environmental quality. She's also an assistant office head in OES. So for those who are not familiar with Interagency Office of Environmental Quality, we call it IOEQ. IOEQ is an example of GDOT's unique and innovative approach to effectively coordinate with various state and federal agencies. So GDOT is probably the first state in nation to implement this concept and multiple state and federal agency representatives are part of this concept. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Sandy Lawrence. Thank you, Haral, and uh, welcome everyone and good morning. So as Haral has already mentioned, uh, but before I actually, before I get started, I wanna go ahead and ask Brian Stanfield to go ahead and launch our first poll or a quiz for the presentation. Please everyone go ahead and participate and also listen while you're participating. This is just to help us get to know you a little bit better. So as uh, Haral mentioned, one of uh, the key parts of producing those quality plans is the collaboration and the communication that goes on between us and EPD. And that is what a workshop will afford you. It'll afford you that opportunity to ask questions and say, uh, if you do get that first review back and there are a lot of comments or you need clarification, then we really encourage you to reach out and to coordinate that first workshop. Uh, that way, maybe you only have one more review and then you're done. That's the ideal scenario. If you do get those uh, second set back and you have substantive comments, then that is where we, we do require you to do a workshop. But this is, again, it's a tool for collaboration and communication. It does not count against you in your performance evaluation at all. It's actually, in my mind, a plus because you're, you're taking advantage of the tools that are out there. And I am the person who coordinates those meetings with EPD reviewers. And here's my contact information, which will be available uh, as part of this presentation as well. Next slide. 
So uh, the other presenters today, our primary presenters, are Robert Elam, the Assistant State Roadway Design Engineer of the Office of Roadway Design, one of the Assistant State Roadway Design Engineers, uh, sharing his expertise and also the GDOT guidance on these plan sets. And then, uh, as Robert mentioned, we have Dewey Richardson from EPD participating today, one of the environmental specialists and the reviewers of these plans to give the EPD perspective and what they're looking for in uh, these plan sets. Additionally, today, uh, Albert Shelby with uh, the Director of Program Delivery will be interjecting uh, at key points in the presentation, as will Christopher Rudd, the State Design Policy Engineer, uh, engineer of the Office of Design Policy and Support. So uh, really a good group of people to share some vital information uh, for everyone today. Before we proceed, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this is a live session, uh, so please be sure not to accidentally hit the pause button or touch uh, the cursor on your screen because you'll no longer be live with us. Just uh, re-enter and you'll be, you'll be okay. Double click or click again. Um, and uh, it is being recorded, so we will be posting this on our external training website so you can reference uh, the information that we share today and also share it with anyone who is not able to attend. This is a two hour presentation. The first hour will be our, our presentation of information uh, with the last hour dedicated to questions and answers. So please do take advantage of that chat box and provide, uh, you know, post any questions you have. When you post the question, you will not see the answer right away. That's kind of all taken place behind the scenes with our moderator, Brian and Sam uh, Woods with Office of Roadway Design. So uh, just we're going to devote that last hour to answering your questions, so please do take advantage. If you have more project specific questions, that's where those workshops that I, I mentioned in the last slide are going to come in handy. So uh, we may not answer those today, but that's your opportunity to coordinate that workshop. And um, I think that's all the information I need to share with you. Uh, I'm going to hand it over now to Robert Elam to uh, take it away, Robert. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Sandy, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our, our uh, ESPC Roadshow. Uh, the slides advance. Let's see here. Let's go. OK, there we go. Uh, George EPD, uh, the goal of this is to improve the quality of our plan set and facilitate the reviews. We've had feedback from George EPD uh, that the quality has declined over time. So too many projects, as previously mentioned, are requiring three, possibly more reviews. So as a result of this, we've been having many issues with projects receiving NTP on time for construction. So uh, this major problem has been going on for several years now, and so this is Roadshow to help kind of identify some common problems that are still being seen in the plans, as well as talk about some policy announcements that will be coming soon with some procedural changes on how we make submittals and things like that for uh, road control plans. The outline this morning, uh, we'll be going over some guidance that's currently available just to make everyone aware, uh, policy updates that are coming, some QAC, QC expectations, and then also the current issues with plans. And let's start with uh, the guidance available. So guidance available for the state of Georgia comes through the GSWCC or the Georgia Soil and Water Conservation Commission, which was created to be the primary Georgia agency to provide guidance on soil and water conservation to comply with federal conservation model and GSA, the Georgia Erosion and Sedimentation Act of 1975. Uh, GSWCC establishes, implements, and also manages the statewide conservation of soil, water, and other related natural resources within each soil and water conservation district. Uh, they also facilitate the development of this manual that I'm showing on screen uh, for the erosion and sediment control in Georgia. Uh, chapter six covers BMP standards and specifications, and then of course the other chapters uh, contain guidance complying with GSA. Uh, GSWCC also develops uh, the ESPCP, sorry for all the acronyms, training and certification requirements. Uh, so 
several levels of certification, a level 1A, which for the subcontractors, persons installing or in, uh, inspecting BMPs and non-regulatory inspector, uh, level 1B, which would be regulatory inspectors and non-regulatory personnel contracted for regulatory work, and then level 2, uh, which applies to all the pra design practitioners, the personnel designing and or reviewing ESPCPs. Georgia Stormwater or GSWCC also create and publish the ESPCP checklist, as well as publish the Appendix 1, uh, which is consistent with the Georgia MPDES general permit for projects discharging into an impaired stream segment and land disturbances greater or equal to 50 acres. You can see below on the page the uh, reference to the uh, GSWCC webpage for more details and information if needed. Another guidance document available for the state of Georgia is the permit itself, the NPDES GAR 100002 permit, which EPA authorizes EPD to issue. This is known as the infrastructure permit. It applies to all GDOT projects with land disturbance greater or equal to one acre, projects with land disturbance greater than one, one acre, but not contiguous projects are exempt. Contiguous means, and if you look in the permit, pages eight through nine, it means areas of land disturbances that are in actual contact to create a connected, uninterrupted area of land disturbance, including land disturbances separated by drilling, uh, borings, roadways, and railways. Also includes all disturbance at an intersection as well. Uh, this permit covers projects that consist solely of routine maintenance, uh, or I'm sorry, projects that consist solely of routine maintenance without mass grading and construction less than 120 days are exempt. Uh, this requires a notice of intent to begin land disturbance and notice of termination after project is completed. One thing to note that this is a five year permit and the current permit is expiring in July. 31 of this year. Uh, there's no detail yet to share on what changes are going to be coming. Uh, the projects that are covered under the existing permit will have 90 days to file for a new permit once the new per permit becomes effective, which is the day after the existing, this current permit expires. So be on the lookout on EPD's website for changes. Uh, we also uh, look at the upcoming permit and we'll be uh, sending out notification for any updates that are required to our checklist uh, for any of the permits that are existing as well as the uh, that's a yearly exercise that GDOT does to review and make sure we're current with all our checklist items. And uh, uh, thanks goes out to Brian Stanfield with the Office of Design Policy for that review. So let's look at some specific GDOT guidance that's available. Most everyone is well aware of our roads page, uh, so you know you can go, you can navigate to that page going through dot.ga.gov, selecting doing business with GDOT, and then selecting manuals and training, and then selecting design manuals and software. So from this page, this is our roads page, a repository for online access to documentation and standards web page. You could access a, a myriad of GDOT information as well as other design related resources. So from below, you would select view manuals and guidelines. And that would take you to this. This next page in which you could access the top. If you scroll down, you'll see the plan development process where you have access to the Plan development process manual, which contains some information. Also, you continue to scroll down to the roadway section and select that category uh, under the construction stormwater erosion control. You'll find various documents that will help with the development of these plans as well. I want to highlight a few documents uh, that are on that section. One is this outfall location guidance document. This was developed back in 2021 and it provides various examples of outfalls and provides details, examples for designers to help determine outfall locations. Some definitions are also clarified and there's some practical guidance provided. If you're not sure about an outfall location, it's best to discuss uh, with the subject matter expert 
uh, with GDOT or with EPD uh, before just moving forward with the design. The other document here I wanted to mention was the EPD no review and review guidance document. This is also from 2021. This document sets criteria for when EPD will respond with a no review letter. In other words, if the plans have so many deficiencies, EPD will not provide comments uh, which need to be addressed, but instead they will just send a no review letter, which requires the designer uh, to uh, uh, to resubmit after major improvements are made to the plans. It also provides guidance with the sections 50 through 56 of the plan set for some of the common deficiencies that are often seen in the plan. So please take time to review this document. Uh, some of the some of the highlighted things would be, you know, plans did not include the correct checklist or the checklist date doesn't match the let date. Uh, if there's over uh, greater than 13 checklist items, roughly 25% are incorrect or deficient, that would uh, get a no review letter. If there's failures uh, to note, you know, outfalls that are on the plans that should have been noted. So various things that will help you with guidance uh, on, on how to uh, improve the quality of the plan submittal. Also, the next document you'll see there is a common errors document. Uh, this document was created by our Office of Engineering Services back in January uh, of 2022. It includes the top 10 checklist items that had deficiencies noted from the EPD reviews. So a very helpful document to take care of some of the common uh, problems that were seen back then. Of course, this document is has a shelf life, so it's important to know that you know this is from January 2022, and, and there's discussions that it may be time here uh, shortly to probably try to update that again and come up with a new uh, common top 10. Uh, the next document you see there is a quality assurance form. Uh, this one we're gonna talk about a little bit further uh, later in the presentation. Also the general notes template, I wanted to note that when producing your plans, always make sure to go out and download the latest general notes template. It's currently 2023. Uh, when downloading this file, uh, you'll see the erosion control tables spreadsheets. You're also gonna see checklist and checklist guidance that's inside the document. Uh, also the general notes for the 51 series plans are in there. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but Office of Design Policy reviews this at the end of each year. Uh, once GSWCC posts any updates in December for potential changes needed, then uh, Design Policy goes and gets those and gathers that information and updates these checklists appropriately. The next uh, section I wanted to mention, if you scroll further down, of course, is the plan presentation guidelines. Uh, we will find information about that. You continue to scroll down, you'll find the electronic data guidelines that has additional information that helps with putting together the plan sections. Continue to scroll down, you'll also come to the external resource section, and that actually has a copy of the current permit uh, that's posted there as well. So next, I'll talk a little bit about some policy updates that should be announced in coming forth, right? To start, let's talk about the timeline requirements uh, as well as some new signature requirements for the buffer variance applications. Remember, this submittal is much earlier in the process from the ESPC plan submittal that goes to EPD for review. This is, uh, this is something that, ha that has this timeline. You can refer to this 2023 environmental plan lockdown schedule. This can be found by navigating you know, to our DOT website, going under the Doing Business for GDOT, selecting the manuals and training also, and then under the Environmental and Cultural Guidebooks, you will find this information. When a BV uh, buffer variance is required, an application must be submitted, and a timeline for this submission would be you know, 38 weeks prior to let for a project needing an individual permit, or it would be 31 weeks prior for regional and national uh, per nationwide permits. One thing I wanted to note here, it's important that the submittal should be four weeks ahead of those dates if there are any hot button issues or hot button changes 
that haven't already been communicated and transmitted to environmental, they request that submittal be four weeks in advance for those types of changes. Also note this uh, here below the chart that the importance of us meeting these dates. Uh, not meeting these dates will result in delays obtaining permits and buffer variances, uh, as well as completing on-time environmental certification. The next is the section 50 update I wanted to mention. Uh, the, the sheet cell for the erosion control plan cover sheet has been updated, and you can see some highlight here that I wanted to bring attention to everyone. You'll notice that the plan preparer signature block now includes a level two certification number. Uh, the preparer of the plan must be a design professional. Of course, all notes and information on the cover sheet are also important, but to highlight a concern from EPD, see the certification note here immediately above the plans preparer block. The note reads that a site visit was made before the plans were prepared. So by adding your name and the certification number to this block, you're certifying that a site visit has been made prior to plans being developed. As part of the buffer variance application, this is this all needs this is all that needs to be completed on, for the application on the cover sheet. The remainder of the signature blocks will be completed prior to the submission to EPD uh, for the ES and PC plans approval, which we'll discuss shortly. Another policy update is the signature requirements on the plan submittal to EPD. So this is not something that's new. It's just now clarified on the cover sheet. So the development of the plan must be done, as we mentioned earlier, by a qualified design professional. EPD mentioned that they believe the plans are often being developed by non-qualified designers. So this requirement is provided in the NPDES permit. If you look in the permit on page 20, part four of the permit, you can see that it specifically highlights in yellow that the plan should be prepared by a design professional as de design, uh, defined by the permit. Also, part, uh, page four, part one, section B of the permit uh, notes what the definition is of a design professional, meaning license in the state of Georgia. So another update uh, that has come is this QAQC process is already part of the plan development process, but going forward, we are asking for a certification statement to be included with the plan submittal. So once plans are ready for submission and the QA review by someone other than the preparer of the plan is completed, an independent qualified reviewer will sign a certification statement, which includes their level two design professional certification number with the submittal. This is going to be for the initial submittal as well as any revisions. So for the initial submittal, you can see this example on the lower right. Uh, you can submit a separate letter with the certification statement uh, when you submit the plans originally to EPD. And for any revisions that you may get back from a comments letter from EPD, you can include those this certification statement back in the response letter to EPD. One of the other uh, updates to the plans is that the uh, has been it's been moved earlier in the process. The submittal to EPD has been moved up a little bit uh, earlier in the PDP to help ensure that the plans are on time and approved for the let. The plans will now be submitted 18 weeks ahead of that same time as CFFPR plans are submitted. And there'll be, there should be a policy announcement coming soon from OPD on this change in the PDP. At this time, I would like to, uh, well, I get uh, turn it over to uh, introduce Albert Shelby. So good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Albert Shelby. I'm the Director of Program Delivery um, over here at GDI. And I just want to emphasize what we're expecting from the consultant community. Um, obviously, the expectation is quality products on time. Um, so we want to also emphasize the fact that for erosion control plans, we have to get these things approved in order to keep the contractors moving. Uh, they're, they're absolutely financial ramifications 
to not have any erosion control plan approval um, to allow the contractor to start working on clearing and grubbing. So to that end, and as Robert just mentioned, we're going to change the PDP so that erosion control plans will be submitted with corrected FFPR plans. Uh, we're going through right now with some tweaks to the memo before we get it out there for everybody to see, but that that becomes a best practice. Um, number one, it allows us to give more time for these reviews while we're still working towards the other certifications. Number two, it allows the project managers to better track getting that approval while it's off of critical path for award to the contractor and the contractor starting to work. Ideally, we would have the road control plans approved at the same time we have certifications for utilities right away um, and, and environmental. And that, that's kind of what we're going to be working towards, and it, it keeps our eyes on um, what's going on with those particular reviews and as well as having everybody report out at lead status so I can keep an eye on what's going on with all these erosion control reviews. So just wanted to get on and highlight the importance of that um, and good luck to everybody to make sure that they are presenting quality products on time. Thanks. Okay. So just to reiterate uh, what Albert had mentioned, the recent change on the submittal time frame. This is important just to note that it's going to be eight weeks earlier than when we typically submit these plans, uh, which is going to uh, hopefully push a better review for the FFPR time frame. Uh, we'll be submitting these basically at 18 weeks, which would be the same time frame as the corrected FFPR plans are submitted. Uh, these 18 week plans, we need to have high quality on these submittals. Please do not submit bad plans uh, that will require multiple reviews and rounds of reviews. So a QAQC in advance of that submittal is critical. Uh, also, I wanted to note that some of you all are seeing uh, the response letter, the final response letter from EPD, that is the approval of the plans with no deficiencies letter. They're asking for a PDF set sometimes. This is for record keeping and just a reminder that you know they don't get a PDF set ahead of time. So that's why they're asking for that final PDF set to be submitted is so they have a final record of the cleaned up plans and approved plans. And one other thing I wanted to note on the screen you see highlighted is the electronic review process. Uh, we've been working with EPD to help streamline our review process and uh, going to electronic review is in the works. We don't have uh, updates yet on when that will be implemented. Just wanted to let everyone be aware that that is a process that's being worked on now and finalized. So some of the guidance available uh, or, or, or next topic we're going to talk about is the QAQC expectations. So QAQC does not begin at plan submittal. You know, to ensure high quality, it requires a day-to-day -day QC to be performed along the way, in addition to QA package reviews that occur before official submittals. I would like to take this moment now to uh, turn it over to Christopher Rudd with the Office of Design Policy and Support to say a few words. Hey, thank you, Robert. Uh, well, since we're talking about uh, quality erosion control plans this morning, you know, it may be obvious to know that good quality plans require that our designers are, are clear on at least the basics of erosion control and, and what's required in the plans. And we also recognize that designers, you know, they may have questions as they're preparing erosion control plans. We would much rather it be the case that designers come and ask these questions before they submit the plans instead of having to do rework after a review is done. So <clears throat> in light of that and uh, the Office of Design Policy, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have on erosion control. Our main point of contact on that is going to be uh, Lewis Vasquez. Lewis is a member of our Water Resources Group under Brad McManus in Design Policy. Um, Lewis has a lot of experience with drainage, water uh, quality analysis in general. He's very knowledgeable about erosion control plans specifically. So if you have any questions at all 
about the requirements around road control plans, checklist items, anything at all that pertains to road control, please don't hesitate to contact Lewis there in design policy. Um, and his email is listed there on the slide. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate that. OK, thank you, Chris. So just to reiterate a couple of things that Chris mentioned, you know, when in doubt, ask. You know, in addition, in addition to those that we've mentioned today presenting, uh, EPD is also available to answer questions or help work through uh, specific design related issues. So don't be afraid to ask questions. That's the key. We don't want to move forward with a uh, potential issue in the plan set that then has to go through multiple rounds of review. Also uh, on the screen, you'll see be sure to incorporate the new QA form, uh, which we'll discuss next. And remember, this is a collaborative effort uh, to ensure that our waters are protected. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions when in doubt. OK, uh, so the QA form that's been talked about a couple of times here, uh, as noted earlier, you know, this is you'll be able to access this form through the roads website. Uh, this form will be included in a po policy announcement that comes soon. Uh, also, see the current FFPR inspection request checklist, uh, which already has this form included on the checklist. But to point out a few things you can see on screen, uh, you know, there's there's high level or low lying fruit that we're you know looking at. So obviously QC of outfalls, drainage area delineations, making sure those are QC'd in advance of the QA review. Uh, you know, looking at coordination between various tables and the plans. So this form is in conjunction with the top 10 list that was mentioned earlier with common errors. And you'll notice that, you know, that that's what we're trying to do is clean up the most common things first. And hopefully, you know, by doing that, uh, we're going to improve the quality of the plans that are being submitted for final reviews. And at this time, we're going to change gears and actually start talking about some of the current issues that the plan reviewers are seeing. And I'd like to uh, introduce Dewey Richardson with the Environmental Protection Division uh, to take it from here and uh, talk on some of the common errors and problems that he's seeing within the plans. Thank you, Robert. Um, my name is Dewey Richardson. I'm with the Environmental Protection Division. Uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been with EPD. It'll be 28 years in April. 15 of those have been dealing with erosion control, be it either enforcement compliance in the districts or working with the programs, doing plan reviews uh, and state water determinations, which is what I currently do. Uh, next slide. First off, I want to talk about uh, the plan in general how it's all related. Um, and I, I think that kind of brings about a better understanding and also shows how when you make one change, you need to be checking other series to make sure that everything um, is revised accordingly. Uh, first off is the 53 series, which is what I like to say is the heart of the plan. Uh, when, when designing, uh, the ESPC plan the folks should be on correctly delineating the contrude and drainage basins in the 53 series. Basically, you would start by determining the permit to find outfalls on the project and just make sure that this is not confused with outfalls noted in the 21 series. Um, basically, an outfall is a location where stormwater in a discernible confined and discrete conveyance leaves a facility or construction site or if there is receiving water on site, becomes a point source discharging into that receiving water. Uh, next slide. Basically, a permit to find outfall uh, is a pipe or a ditch that discharges storm water from the project, which is uh, the right of way, or directly into a receiving water on site. So once you found out what the outfalls are, you then um, figure out what the drainage area for the contributing drainage uh, basins are and delineate those in the 53 series. And then the information that you have for each contributing drainage basin is then used in the sediment storage table 
to calculate the 67 cubic yards of st uh, storage per acre drained. And this determines the type and amount of BMPs needed on the project to ensure adequate trapping uh, efficiency. Next slide. Then the 53 series also related to the sampling table. All permit to find outfalls in the 53 series should be sampled or represented by a sampling location. And likewise, the sampling table is related to the 55 series. Uh, the 55 series should note the station number and offsets of the sampling locations, as well as delineate the watershed or the surface water drainage area of the receiving waters noted in the sampling table. And that's basically used to help determine what the Appendix B NTU values are for your outfall sampling. And then this is just an example of a 53 series. Um, next. And then the information that you should have for your outfalls within the 53 series. Next slide. And then again, you know, all of this is related. All the outfalls that you had in the 53 series should be shown in the sediment storage table and likewise in, in the sampling table. Next. And then, uh, as I stated earlier, basically you're delineating the surface water drainage area for the receiving waters in the sampling table. Um, in instances where you're delineating it in the surface water drainage area is bigger than the map, then you'd want to make a note of that. And in instances like this, where you're kind of, you know, have a far off view of the project, it's good to do an inset or an additional map where you have a closer view of the project and the sampling locations. Next. Uh, these are some guidance documents that really should be used when you're doing your plan design. Uh, like Robert said, um, when you go through your certification, you, you're pretty much aware of the manual and the permit. These are a little bit more you know, obscure, uh, but really should be used. And that is the GDOT PPG. I always you know, try to tell everyone that 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 should be your your basis for doing your plan design. I mean, I think it pretty much hits on everything that you need. Um, and then we have the EPD plan submittal guidance, which is basically just the revised no review guidance. Uh, it's missing the critical elements that, you know, make a no review. That way uh, you guys can know exactly what needs to be in the plans and the issues that we're coming across. Then you have the erosion control outfall location guidance that was done up by GDOT. It's a very good reference to determining where your outfalls are located. And then what we call the red letter guidance for the checklist. When you go to the soil and water website and download the most recent checklist, this will be right after the checklist and basically what the red letter guidance does it kind of gives a little bit better explanation for what's required for each checklist item next all right next i want to talk about what to consider when designing a plan um next slide in the 50 series basically you want to ensure that the level two certification number of the design professional is noted and correct, provide the signature and seal of the design professional as well. You want to note the plan's completed date. If a revision has occurred, note the date and entity requesting the revision. Uh, basically, the cover page shows the history of the review process. Uh, the GPS locations, of course, probably needs to not be said, but they need to be associated with the project and on the center line. The GPS location should be in decimal degrees. Uh, the Sandy map, it should be legible and um, we prefer it to be close enough that you can see where the uh, project location is at in the surrounding uh, highways and roads. Uh, next. 51 series. Uh, basically, you want to provide the applicable uh, checklist, you know, the most recent one for each year. Uh, you want to use the current version of the GDOT template for the 51 series, of course, with modifications. Uh, when writing the narrative for the sequence of major activities, do not mention any land disturbing activities, including clearing and grubbing in the initial phase. 
Um, the limits of disturbance for the initial phase should delineate only the area required to be disturbed for the installation of perimeter control BMPs and initial sediment storage. Next slide. Under the post construction BMPs for stormwater management, only list the BMPs used on the project. Uh, provide a charter table listing the percentage of soil types on the project. Make sure that the acreage for the area of interest reflects what the actual project size is. You need to verify that there are no bio uh, biota impaired stream segments within one mile of the project. If so, you need to make sure that you complete the chart that's shown in the 51 series template and you need to add the appendix one listing the four additional BMPs that are going to be used on the project. If using alternative BMPs, the biggest one that you have on GDOT projects or the fabric check dams, you need to make sure that you provide the required documentation uh, packet. You need to add the alternative BMP certification statement to the plan and add the detail sheet, which I believe is D-24D to the 56 series. Next. For the riprap outlet protection table, you need to make sure that you're using again the table that's in the 51 series template. Uh, if you're using structure numbers or outfall IDs, you need to add the labels to the structures on the plan sheets where the BMP is initially installed. If you're using the station number and offset, the station number and offset should be the location of the outlet protection, uh, not the pipe or the culvert. Um, the labels including the STRP for outlet protection and the pattern should be in bold in the stage where it's initially installed and then shown faded in subsequent stages because it is a permanent BMP. Next slide. With the sampling table, you need to make sure that all outfalls basins in the 53 series are sampled or represented by a sampling location. Uh, do not label the sampling locations chronologically. The label should reflect the outfall basins or uh, receiving waters being sampled. The sampling location should correspond with the outfall location. For receiving waters, the upstream and downstream location should be in the middle of the stream at the right of way. Each receiving water listed in a sampling table should have only one value in square miles for a surface water drainage area. I've, I've seen it vary, but it, there should be only one value. Uh, verify the appendix B NTU value based on the total site size and the surface water drainage area of the receiving water in question. Ensure that the NTU values are in the correct column. In other words, you, you don't want to put the outfall appendix B NTU value in the column for the receiving water uh, NTU value. Next slide. For the buffer encroachment table, uh, when noting the impacts in the buffer encroachment table, the location should be the furthest points of impact to the buffer along the center line. The location should be noted for each side of the project, both left and right, if the feature crosses the center line for a total of four locations. Make sure that you're only putting uh, buffered state waters with impacts uh, in the table. And then if you have any uh, drainage structures within the buffer, like ditches, you need to make sure that they're constructed of non-erodible material. Next slide. Sediment storage table, uh, the information, drainage areas, disturbed areas, number of outfalls uh, in the sediment storage table should correspond with the information in the 53 series. Uh, the disturbed areas in the table should add up to the total disturbed area for the project uh, noted in the plan. While most tables are generated using an Excel spreadsheet, the value should be uh, checked to make sure that rounding areas have not occurred uh, based on the data in the table. We, we see that a lot. Uh, when adding the written justifications, provide the reasons uh, basically lack of topography, right away ESAs, uh, for not using temporary sediment basins or meeting the storage requirement. And those justifications are separate from each other because you could be using a sediment basin, but not meeting um, the storage requirement uh, and vice versa. So you need to make sure that you have a justification for each if needed. Next slide. Uh, in the 53 series, uh, you need to delineate the contributing drainage basins on the map based on the permit to find outfalls of the project. And again, you can use that uh, outfall guidance to figure out exactly what qualifies as an outfall. 
basically an outfall is a structure, a pipe, ditch, you know, et cetera, that discharges stormwater from the project limits, which is the right of way, or directly into receiving water on site in a concentrated manner. Uh, the following are examples of structures that do not meet the definition of an outfall in the permit. And that's pipes that discharge within the project limits where the stormwater would transition in the sheet flow before leaving the project. Excuse me, um, <clears throat> pipes that discharge into a ditch that runs parallel to the project and ditches that discharge within the project limits. Uh, the required information for the outfall should be noted in the FIT-3 series and that's stated in uh, the PPG. Next slide. In the FIT-4 series, um, all the required information noted in the PPG should be shown on the plan sheets. Uh, again, I can't stress how much if you use the PPG, your plan should be, you know, pretty much on point. Uh, if staging construction, the guidelines noted in the first paragraph of section 54.002 in the PPG should be followed, which basically is saying that when you're staging, active construction should be in bold and then in subsequent stages, uh, non-active construction should be faded. Um, do not show cut fill lines or land disturbing activities in the initial phase of the plan. The initial phase should delineate only the area required to be disturbed for the installation of perimeter control BMPs in initial sediment storage. Do not use perennial or intermittent waters of the state for temporary or permanent sediment detention. Um, an example of that would be a culvert um, that's conveying a receiving water through the project and you're trying to put a silt gate uh, on the inlet side of that culvert. You don't want to do that. Uh, next slide. All plan sheets with cut field lines or land disturbing activities should show temporary and or permanent stabilization measures. Temporary measures should be shown faded in subsequent stages until permanent measures are installed. Uh, you need to have two rows of type S sediment barriers uh, installed along all state waters per the manual. Yeah, you need to install silt fence behind all pipe outlets that discharge stormwater from the project, basically your outfalls or conveyor receiving water. Do not install silt fence in areas of concentrated flow that's in the pipes, cross ditches, areas like that. Uh, the gaps or breaks in the silt fence uh, due to those areas of concentrated flow should be filled with the appropriate BMP, like a check dam, rock filter dam, to mimic a closed system. Next slide. In the 55 series, delineate surface water drainage areas for all receiving waters in the sampling table. And you can see the definition in the permit if you're a little confused about how to delineate that watershed. Um, if the drainage area is too large to fully delineate on the map, then have statements stating such, like I mentioned before, um, and note the drainage area in square miles. The sampling location should correspond with the sampling table. Next slide. And then uh, in the 56 series, basically you just wanna make sure that you're providing the detail sheets for all BMPs used on the, the project. I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Next, talk a little bit about QA and QC now. Um, basically just remember that the different sections of the plan are related. If you make a revision, think of how it may be related to other sections and revise accordingly. For instance, if you remove an outfall from the 53 series, it would also need to be removed from the sediment storage table and the sampling table. Um, uh, you revise an outfall location, the sampling location uh, would be revised in the sampling table in the 55 series as well if you sample that location. Um, do not revise the plan unless it's related to a deficiency noted in the review letter. For example, adding back an outfall that was removed in a previous revision. What this does is it prompts a full review to ensure that nothing else has changed rather than reviewing the revised plan based solely on the deficiency noted in the review letter. Next. Uh, like we've mentioned earlier, we've asked that a certification statement um, be added to uh, all your plans. The design professional doing the review should verify that the deficiency noted in the review letter uh, have been addressed. 
And then finally, bus design professionals should review the key elements of the plan list below to ensure that there are no mistakes that may trigger a full review of the revised plan. This is kind of what we consider the big seven, and that's the outlet protection, the 53 series, the sampling table, the 55 series, the sediment storage table, uh, your buffer encroachment table and your buffers, and then your BMP installation in the 54 series. Next. And that's it. Down to questions. I'll turn it back over to Mr. Robert. Thank you, Dewey. OK, so that that ends our presentation portion of our training, and I, I see some questions have been put into the chat and responded to. There's some new questions also that have come in. Brian or Sam, do y'all see any that we specifically want to address right now in the chat? Yes, Robert, can you hear me? I sure can. Yes, we have several questions we wanted to save for this Q&A. <clears throat> we can start with the first one. It's pertaining to level two design professional requirements. If you have a project on which uh, you have someone who is not a design professional or maybe have a level two certification, but who is a reviewer, to what extent can they uh, participate in the design of a ESPC plans? I can I can take that, Dewey, unless you wanted to respond to that one, but uh, the level as far as if just to make sure I understand the question correctly, if it, it's regarding the plan preparer, then that is according to the permit requirements is to be a design professional, which means a uh, level two design professional or the CEP, we didn't go over this, but there's a CEP ESC uh, certification that can also be attained for the preparer of the plan. Now, with that being said, we often have designers that are not PEs that help compile these plans for us. Part of that process, and I mentioned this earlier, was the QC and the QA of the plan set but basically a design professional has to take ownership as the plan preparer. So if you have a non-certified person that's helping to compile these plans, the plan preparer, the design professional, has to take ownership and has to review the plans close enough to ensure that they were designed by basically a quali uh, qualified plan set. Does that make sense? I hope I answered that question. OK. Uh, were there any other questions in the chat that came up we want to look at for a response? Yeah. Another question was uh, uh, pertaining to the schedule P6. Will there be more uh, time provided for to accomplish quality final ESPCP if that's an 18 week date? So, so the submittal of the plan set has been moved up to 18 weeks, which is basically the same time that corrected FFPR plans are submitted. And at that point, you know, we're not making plan changes anymore uh, at that point. So corrected is a, you've addressed all of the FFPR comments at that time, and there should not be any more plan changes that are occurring after that point in time. So there won't be a change if, if I'm understanding the question, uh, there will not be a change to the schedule or durations. I don't know, Albert, if you wanted to speak to that or anything, but because uh, the uh, you know the plans are complete basically at CFFPR. Correct. And I don't even understand why that's a, that's confusing. You know, that's what we've been doing for decades. So, I mean, all you're, you're actually getting more time to get the erosion control plans cleaned up and approved as opposed to doing it at, at you know, after PSNE has been submitted. So, everybody should be happy. You're getting more time. 
Yeah, and to piggy off, piggy, piggyback off of that, you know, obviously the, the the issue here is a QA QC process. So you know, internal to your office, uh, everyone's various offices, they have to make sure they have good quality control for the day to day checks, and then they have the QA process in place, which is already defined by the PDP. So uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. OK, Brian, do you see any others in the chat? Yes, we have quite a few. OK, and uh, the next one would be about sediment storage table. Does it need to be broken out by stages, by outfalls or both? By outfalls. OK, and the next question is. Uh, about uh, series 55 plants, uh, it says uh, it needs to be in a 2000 scale. Uh, would this be a supplemental sheet? And if so, will GDOT accept the inclusion in, in the plants? Well, I can't, ex you know, talk about GDOT's, uh, you know, acceptance of it, but I were simply asking for it's just an inset map that shows a closer view of the project with sampling locations. And anytime I've requested it, it's been done, so I'm assuming GDOT will accept it. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to read some questions that are pretty lengthy. Yeah, I think we would have to save some questions for later. We would respond to you uh, after this presentation because they're more in depth. OK. Just give us a second here to scroll through the rest of the chat and see if there's anything else. Yes, um, there is a there is a question about the uh, submitting. When when will the 18 weeks prior to let be required? When will we start submitting that? Uh, what what we've done is we've tried to encourage uh, go ahead and start trying to accomplish that. There is a policy announcement that will be coming that will put a definite date to things uh, for the policy change, but I would recommend and what I've already started asking uh, my group managers to do for the projects that are letting later in this year or early next year. I'm trying to shoot for that 18 week submittal now uh, just in anticipation of the policy announcement that's coming. I'm trying to read through if anybody sees one as I'm scrolling through here, feel free. I'll, I'll summarize one, Robert. This is Sam Woods. Uh, the, the flavor of the question is maybe some potential confusion about the definition of a post construction uh, BMP. And my read of that question is maybe an overlap with an, an MS4 type uh, BMP. So maybe someone on the panel could speak to that. Basically, what that is asking for are your BMPs that, yeah, if there's an MS4, it, it may be associated uh, with that, but it's basically BMPs that are going to be put in to filter out any uh, known pollution with the construction activity, if that makes sense. Hey, Brian, uh, yes. if you would, I would go ahead before I forget. I know we had a second poll that you were going to put into the chat. If you could go ahead and post that out there, I would ask uh, the attendees to fill out this additional poll that we have. Uh, it's going to ask also identify potential uh, future training uh, that may be out there that have need. So if you'll go ahead and get that out there while everyone's still online and we'll keep reading through the uh, chat session here for additional questions to address. 
Yeah, I see another question here that you might be able to address right now. It's a question uh, about the 2023 erosion control template and uh, also that GS, which is based on GSWCC's uh, checklist. And they're asking about the uh, let's see. Yeah, the new review form that, that, that is included in the Excel spreadsheet. Do we include that in the plans as a separate item? So our, is the question about the QA form? Yeah. OK, so the QA form is submitted along with the it, it's on the actual FFPR inspection request checklist now, so it's a uh, attachment that goes along with the submittal package for FFPR. And it's actually on the current checklist that has been added. There's a question here. Uh, where can you find the latest uh, GDOT section 4 general notes sheets? So that is part of the download and correct me, Brian, if I'm mistaken on this, but the, the template, the GDOT general notes template that's out there on roads, when they download that file, it's a zipped file. It includes some spreadsheet, it includes a spreadsheet, also uh, some other documents, also the DGN file, uh, and, and those are in both format, correct? It's a, there's an open roads format and there's also the in roads format files that are available and they all come in that one downloaded file, which is why we recommend uh, whether you're, you know, you're starting another erosion control plan set that you had done recently, maybe, you know, half a year, six months ago, uh, we always recommend go out and download the latest template and information. So uh, sometimes changes occur to these files uh, throughout the year. And and it's best to try to capture the latest file. So never pull over. I know it's easy to copy and paste from another project, but we recommend on the for development of the erosion control plans that you pull down the latest template every time. Yeah, I think Robert, you're talking about section 51 erosion control general notes. They're asking about section four. Oh, section four. Sorry. Yeah, I did not catch that. Uh, so those should be a cell that's out there in MicroStation. They maintain the cell for that. Yeah, this is Sam Woods. Just a quick follow up on that, even though it's not really related to this topic, is that there's no analogous sheet cell yet for section four. The department's considering developing that, but there are cells for individual general notes for section four. But to reiterate what Rob, everything Robert said is correct, that's section 51. Erosion control general notes, yep. There's a general question here about this presentation. Can this presentation be posted anywhere afterwards? Yes, and I apologize for not uh, providing that link in the presentation. I meant to do that. Sandy, can you post the link to that website that you sent me the other day where these videos are posted? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, and uh, it, it's not posted now, but it will be. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the video won't be immediate. There will be a follow up. Uh, it will be you know, shortened, obviously, and clipped and cropped, and then we'll we'll get that uploaded to the location that Sandy will put out in the chat uh, for future reference. Yeah, and to add to that, uh, we might not be able to answer all of your questions that you're posting, but uh, you know, right now, but we will uh, look at them after this presentation and also include the answers to your questions. There is a question about uh, GSWCC levels. Do we need to go through 1A and 1B training before obtaining level two? No, you do not. Uh, so the requirements for the design professional uh, certification and I don't have that pulled up on the from the GSWCC site, but basically it's a licensed uh, professional engineer. So that means a, a Georgia PE professional engineering license, and then the uh, certification course has to be taken to get the level two design professional. 
Yeah, and I guess you can uh, also get a level two reviewer even if you're not a professional engineer yet. That's correct. Yeah, thanks for bringing that clarification, Brian. And just to reiterate in the presentation, you know, the website for the GSWCC has additional information about those uh, certifications and the certification requirements. One other certification that we didn't get into is a CPESC, and you can see there's uh, some actual uh, experience time that's part of that requirement to attain. And for most practitioners, it seems like the path is about the same as a level two design professional. So I didn't really spend any time talking about the other certification, but you can find more information uh, out there on the GSWTC website that was previously mentioned. There is a question here. Does the QC form need to be included in the FFPR submittal for projects which disturb less than one acre? So for projects that are less than one acre, it, it's a reduced plan set. Uh, so that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong by saying this, but that that's a, uh, a limited scope, if you will, that's required for what's uh, in the submittal package. And that package doesn't go to EPD for uh, review if it's under an acre. No, sir, it did because it, it's not a uh, required permit. So the QC form does not need to be submitted. That's correct. I assume you meant the QA form or they meant the QA form. Right. Okay. Yeah. In that case, it's a, you know, not applicable situation. It's a limited scope sections. Okay. There's a question here. Uh, can a level two reviewer provide a QC or does the QC need to be done by a level two design professional? That's and that's a good question. And this is what we've tried to talk about during this presentation today. The key here is that you know we have a design professional that's qualified to prepare the plan. So that is a level two design professional, which would be a PE that has the level two certification. Uh, that would actually prepare the plan or be responsible for preparing the plan. Then the certification statement that's being included now with these submittals is an independent reviewer certification. So it cannot be the plan preparer that's doing the review. Uh, you have to have an independent review done by a level two uh, certified design professional. And that would be for not just the initial submittal, but for each revision as well. OK, there is another question. Uh, uh, receiving waters means all perennial and intermediate waters of the stream of the state into which the runoff of stormwater from a construction activity will actually discharge either directly or indirectly. The word indirectly would imply that any water feature that flows through the project would be a receiving water. It won't matter if it's perennial or intermittent. Is this correct? A correct interpretation? No, sir, it's not. Like the definition says, it needs to be perennial or intermittent in nature. So if you just have like roadside ditches, uh, ephemeral channels, things like that, they would not be considered receiving waters. It, it has to be perennial or um, intermittent in nature. There is a question. Uh, is the plan sheet need to be stamped and signed? I think it pertains to like every plan sheet. So go ahead, Dewey. I was just going to say that uh, we have an understanding with GDOT 
that the cover sheet is the only thing that has to be um, stamped. Now, of course, if you're not doing a GDOT project, that, that's different, but with GDOT, only the cover sheet has to be. And just to clarify, do it, and that uh, pertains to both consultants and uh, GDOT in-house staff? Yes, sir. Any, anytime you're doing a GDOT project, you only have to stamp the cover sheet. Any projects that you do that are not GDOT related, you, you have to do all the sheets. And, and just to note on that, so the checklist that's provided, uh, the ESPC checklist that we pull down, it does, it, there is a little bit of confusion there about the way the wording says each plan. So just to clarify what Dewey is saying, that's just the cover sheet, for GDOT projects uh, that have to be sealed and signed. There's a question about uh, plans completed date. Uh, what date should it be? So plans completed date would be when you submit those plans to EPD for review. I concur. And there are there's a revision block on the cover sheet. Let me see if oh, there's a revision block on the cover sheet for any future revisions that are needed uh, due to you know, comments received from EPD through the approval process that would just need to be added to the cover sheet. Okay, there's a question. Would the review taking place at corrected FFPR? Or will there also be a second submittal for the NOI? So uh, I assume what they're asking about is that final submittal that we usually make that the design, uh, let's see, it's the uh, designer's checklist to final submittal. That checklist includes half size plan sheets, right? That are basically printed hard copies that are then sent to CBA and then CBA forwards those on to EPD for review. Well, the new process that's been presented today, which is, in, at, is to basically make that submittal at 18 weeks. So there would not be another submittal at final plans, if, if that hopefully clarifies that question. Yeah, and there's the, uh, another question about 50, series 50 cover sheet. When saying that only the cover sheet needs to be signed and sealed, do you mean that 50 series cover sheet in addition to the first series cover sheet? That's correct. So our construction plans, which include sections right one all the way through 60 with the right away plans uh, the cover sheets that have to be signed is our main cover obviously for the construction plans and sealed and then the erosion control cover sheet also signed and sealed okay and another question for the uh, 50 series who would certify the 50 series cover sheet, the plan preparer or QC reviewer? And based on Robert's response about if a level two plan reviewer can QC plans. Yes, that's correct. So the, the idea, I, I assume the question is the certification statement when they say certify. Uh, so the person that's providing the certification statement and this is what's key to understand is an independent reviewer that was not the plan preparer. So I know that's a little confusing, but the plan preparer is level two design professional because we want to make sure that whoever's putting the plans together is qualified uh, and has the knowledge, appropriate knowledge to put the plans together initially. And then the certification statement is basically a check to make sure that the QA was performed at the end by an independent reviewer who also is level two design professional certified. Mm 
Mm -hmm. There's a question here. For Jira design plans, will the chief engineer be the only one stamping the cover sheet with a PE stamp? That's correct. For GDOC projects, that's correct. And then the consultants have the engineer of record that seals, signs and seals the plan, and then the chief also signs and seals the plan. Okay. And another question, does the seal on the 50 series cover need to be a seal of the design professional or should the seal be that of the chief engineer? I guess you just answered that with both for consultants. Yeah, there are a couple more questions, but they're more in depth. We should save them for later and we'll be able to answer them. Uh, with the. Uh, yeah, once we sub submit everything else. Yeah, and what we can do, uh, how to get those questions posted back out. I'm not sure how that process will go. So we have additional questions that for all the attendees, we have additional questions that you're not seeing in the chat. What we'll try to do is compile those, get some answers to those. I'm not sure how that information will get pushed out, uh, maybe through an, uh, the ACEC announcement again or something, I don't know, or maybe it can be attached where the video link is. Sandy, did you post out the link to where the video uh, was going to be available at some point? I did. OK, thank you. Hey Robert, this is Sam and feel free to shut me down if you think we're getting too far into the weeds here. But one question I believe I'll be able to answer in the chat is how should anticipated temporary stream diversions for core permitting be included in the erosion control plans? Are temporary stream diversion profiles needed? And to my knowledge, you know, and experience, they are not part of the erosion control plans, and those temporary stream diversion profiles are, are not part of the erosion control uh, in any way. And maybe there's some confusion about the longitudinal stream profiles needed for um, the to meet the regional conditions of, of the of the nationwide permit. So that that's my response to that question. If anybody had anything to add to that. I just concur with it. Usually we don't see stream diversions in the plan because um, I think you guys leave it up to the contractors to decide, you know, which style to use. Yep, that's my understanding, Dewey. Thank you. And for, again, forgive me if this is too far in the weeds, but uh, because of I love Dewey, what you said about the 53 series being the heart of the erosion control plans. And I saw the, to go back real quickly to this question about outfalls uh, or sediment storage by outfall or by stage. Would it be fair for me to add to that that it, that it's technically both in, in the sense that yes, every outfall needs to be on that sediment storage table. But it, it may be true in some cases that certain outfalls only apply to certain stages of construction. And in that case, that would be covered by the sampling table in the general notes. Like there's a column there for relevant construction stages there. Yeah, um, because I, I think you get into too much when you start separating out the outfall table and the sediment storage table into stages and things like that. So while an outfall may not become valid until a certain stage of construction, if it is actually an outfall and meets the definition, then just label it as such and show it as such to keep it simple. Yeah, that makes sense to me and, and fits perfectly with our existing templates and tables. And uh, if it's OK with everybody to stick on this idea of outfalls again, because it's such a critical part of the whole erosion control plan set, uh, there is a, a specific question about uh, a condition where you've got a drainage system, a proposed drainage system in your project ties into an existing system. And in my head, I'm thinking this is a closed longitudinal curve and gutter pipe system and that existing pipe leaves your site. So is the outfall located inside the pipe where it leaves the project is the first question. And if so, where would the sampling location be? 
The easiest thing I can tell you um, and one thing that should always be considered, which will actually help you identify outfalls, is remember that all outfalls are potential sampling locations. So whenever you're dealing with a closed system, what you want to do is you want to pick the last accessible point within the system before the stormwater leaves the project or discharges directly into a receiving water on site. I hope that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. We've got a, a couple questions about check dams and. The first one is what is the fabric check dam documentation packet is the certification statement the same thing as the note statement? The um, documentation packet is basically uh, the documentation that's required of the te in field testing that you guys have. Um, I'm not sure exactly where y'all have that packet at. I'll have to leave it up to you guys to um, say that. And then the certification statement is the alternative BMP certification statement, which I'd have to look. I'm not sure if that's on y'all's 51 series template or not, but it's actually, um, you know, in the manual. Um, if you go to the appendix section where it talks about alternative BMPs, exactly what needs to be in it. I'd have to pull up y'all's template though to see whether or not it's actually on that. Um, and then what, what was the other part of the question or did that answer? I think you've hit them both. Um, it, it might, so the, it was what is the fabric check dam documentation packet, which you mentioned GDOT maintains those records. And then is the certification statement the note statement? And yes, my, my off the top of my head, I believe that is included in our in our template notes. Uh, I thought Ryan. it was, but I couldn't yeah. I couldn't remember for sure. But if if it wasn't, it's in in the manual in the appendix section that talks about uh, alternative BMPs. And um, then there's also a guidance document that tells you what you need. And I think that's the main place where you have the certification statement, but if it's on the 51 series, then definitely go by that. Thank you, Dewey. And sticking with the theme of check dams, there's a question related to the clear zone. Uh, which check dam type within the clear zone is desirable between silt fence and hay bale check dams? I think that's up to you guys. That's a design um, issue. So I'll let y'all answer that one. Well, in the uh, well, let me go ahead and defer to the to the written answer here. But the, my gut reaction to Sam is either either would strike me as fine within the clear zone. The the discussion I'm usually hearing about types of check dam are between either of those types and like a. A, a, a rock or a stone check dam, which we would would not want in the clear zone. But uh, Robert, Brian, Chris, please sharpen that up if, if it needs to be. I would agree, Sam. Uh, yeah, we don't want the rock check dams, if at all possible, within the clear zone. But yeah, the silt fence or the hay bale would be preferred. I would agree with that as well as Chris. And we've got a question about permanent grassing BMP symbols. Can we show the permanent grassing symbol before the final phase if we reach final grade in that particular area before the final phase? 
Yes, if you've reached final grade and you're going to put um, permanent stabilization in, then yes, you can show the SS for slope stabilization or the DS3 for permanent grassing or DS4 for sod. Um, just make sure that when you go to the final phase, you're, you're showing it through the subsequent stages if needed. And um, that way it shows that it was um, stabilized in an earlier stage. Thank you, Dewey. Uh, another question about sediment basins. Uh, do maintenance access need to be provided on the erosion control plans, and do they need to be fully bermed? I'm not sure I understand that question. So the simplest thing I'll say is that if you're doing any kind of construction land disturbing activity, it should be shown on, on the plan. Okay, thank you, Dewey. And whoever submitted that anonymous question, if you, if you care to clarify that um, in the chat for us to attempt to respond to in writing following the presentation, uh, we can do that. We do have a question from Eric about, it's kind of, I guess, covers both EPD and GDOT. Even if we can't answer it, I guess I'd like to introduce it to the panel. Um, the question and comment reads, based on the comments I've received, the Georgia EPD uh, wants to see edges of pavement, construction limits, drainage, et cetera, constructed in the previous stages to be shaded back in the 54 series. Uh, does GDOT have any guidance on doing this instead of manually copying and clipping these in the related CAD files? And my, my flavor on that question to the panel, it, that, that strikes me as, as a question of, is that needed, the fading or the clipping versus what my understanding of our approach is, is just to use the hatching symbols? Um, from the EPD standpoint, uh, in the permit, it says that you specifically have to show the limits of disturbance and all. So when you do staging, you have to come up with some method that actually shows the difference between what is active construction and non-active. The way you guys have it in the PPG is that your preferred method is bold for active construction and then faded in subsequent stages for non-active. Hatching is an optional method. Uh, I don't have a problem with it so long as the main method of showing active construction is not violated. In other words, you don't want to show hatching in one stage and then in subsequent stage, you've got bold cut and fill lines, bold uh, proposed ditches and, and things of that nature. If you're saying bold is for active construction, then you've got to make sure what you're showing is not conflicting with that main rule. So there's no problem showing the hatching, you just got to make sure that uh, is done correctly. And a lot of times with the hatching, you're only associating the roadway. You're not really associating it with the other things like proposed ditches and, and field slopes and things like that. And got to make sure per the permit that you're showing limits of disturbance. Um, so when you're staging like that, just make sure you're following the rules that you guys have set for staging. I mean, that's the best way I can say that. Thank you, Dewey. Uh, we have a question regarding use on construction revisions. Uh, do ESPCP changes completed during construction need to undergo an additional review by EPD? Uh, that is a UOC revision due to new site development or drainage improvement. Um, generally, the way it works is once it's gone through our review, if you're making changes that uh, are just simply moving silt fence here and there, what everyone calls red line, then that's done on site. 
if it's something that uh, affects a uh, hydraulic component, then it's supposed to be done and certified by a level two design professional. Um, but generally, it does not go back through a uh, review. If I'm understanding the question correctly. Yes, that sounds perfect. Thank you. OK, I'm just going to keep asking these and my my panelists, please let me know if, if we're going too far in the weeds or if we need to redirect. This is a question that uh, that I see somewhat inconsistently on plans also is how do you, if at all, want to see sheet flow leaving the site in the sediment storage table? In other words, should that sediment storage table only contain outfalls in their respective drainage areas or should they also include uh, sheet flow leaving the site? Now, now you're speaking just solely for the sediment storage table? Yes. In the sediment storage table, um, there's kind of two answers to that. One, if you're showing um, sheet flow areas, which are, are not required in, in the 53 series, and you've got them divvied out in such a way, like you got sheet flow area one, two, three, and you're showing the drainage area and disturbed area for those areas, it would be good to make sure that that's mimicked in the sediment storage table. However, if you're not getting value, giving values for drainage areas or disturbed areas in the 53 series, it's fine just to have a uh, row for total sheet flow for the project. Thank you. I guess I would say with that too, the biggest thing is make sure that it's all just captured in the sediment storage table. Do not forget about <laughs> sheet flow and leave it out. It's like I said earlier, make sure that when you put everything in the sediment storage table, when you add up those uh, disturbed areas in the table, it covers all the disturbed area that you say is occurring on the project in the 53 series. Thank you, Dewey. Maybe we give Dewey a breather here uh, on the Q&A and I'll, I'll throw it to a different flavor type question here. For consultant design projects, does GDOT always retain consultants on contract after letting for use on construction revisions? Yes. Standard practice. Everybody's going to get a UOC slash shop drawings billable rates contract that should at least go a year beyond the letting, if not longer, depending on the size and complexity of the project. All right, thank you, Albert. So a, a bit of a follow up question here. So in a closed system, a closed drainage system, the sampling location would be located in the curb inlet before the water leaves the site. That's one option. I mean, it could be a drop inlet. It could be a catch basin, you know, just whatever accessible point is in the system before the storm water leaves the project. And that that again is because it could be a potential sampling location and you can't just have it, you know, in the closed system at the where the pipe leaves the project. You got to make sure it's accessible in case you have to do sampling. All right, thank you, Dewey. This is more of a general a hydraulic engineering question, I suppose, but the question from Anonymous is, how do I determine if the water has returned to sheet flow after leaving a pipe? Based off of contours and, and stuff, I mean, I, I don't know how to answer that other than you'd have to, you know, be on site to know whether or not that pipe has created such a, a flow um, that there's a ditch there that the pipe discharges into before leaving the project. And in that case, the ditch itself would be the outfall at the project limits. If you've got a, a pipe that's 
you know, let's just say halfway between the center line and the right of way, you know, there's a, a, a good, you know, basis that that's probably going to disperse in the sheet flow before, you know, it goes. And if, you know, you feel otherwise, then you're just going to have to show proof that that's the case. Thank you. Um, how many times on a sheet does the DS1 slash 2 and DS3 need to be shown? How's that for a question? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fine. Um, generally, if, if you're if you have the simple initial intermediate final, I, I don't get too picky. I just at least want to see it, you know, one time. If you're doing staging where um you're you know doing construction on let's say the right side of the project and you're showing the ds ds1 there and then in uh the following stage you're doing construction on the left side so you've got to add new um ds1 ds2 to it i would say that in that subsequent um stage you'd need to have it on show it on both the left and the right sides because right will be associated with the previous construction and the left will be uh, associated with the new construction and if you're doing it by the shading like you're supposed to do for staging the right side that was done in the previous would be faded and then the new construction on the left side that labeling would be in bold because it was just added during that uh, stage of construction Thank you, Dewey. I have a question. How do you determine if an erosion control plan needs to be prepared for a maintenance project? Does the one acre of disturbed area rule still apply? Anytime words, you do LDA over an acre, it, uh, a permit is required. OK, thank you. have a question about what the difference between total disturbed area and the total project area. Yeah, so, the, the, the total project area is basically the site size, you know, basically what y'all would consider right away to right away, you know, from the begin project to the end project, including any kind of you know, limits of construction for any side roads, stuff like that. And then your total disturbed area uh, is basically whatever area that you disturb. And that's, you know, usually less. I mean, I won't say it's always that, but it's usually less than your total project area. Yeah, thank you, Dewey. I, I agree that the total disturbed area would always be less than or equal to the total project area. And to help me think through this in the past, I've found this quote unquote equation to be helpful. Something something like um, total project area, excuse me, total disturbed area equals total project area minus things you don't disturb, as Dewey just said. So it, typically in my experience that that includes areas with bordered by orange barrier fence where the contractor is specifically prohibited from clearing and any existing pavement that isn't going to be removed. That would be construction area that's not disturbed. So I just wanted to add on that, that flavor to that answer. I would agree. Okay, there's, the, there's, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, I was Robert. Just yep. Seeing the one question that popped in about the milling and inlaying an entire uh, parking area, does that count toward disturbed area? So this is milling and inlaying on existing pavement. So in that scenario, we're not doing land disturbing activities. You're just milling and replacing on existing pavements. So that would not count toward disturbed area. Yep, thank you, Robert. And Brad, 
Uh, I'm seeing your comment about sheet flow from the pipes. Yeah, we can provide a more specific answer to that in the in the formally published questions and answers. Uh, another question about outfall basins. When delineating an outfall basin, do we include only uh, what is contributing within our project limits? In other words, the right of way, or do we have to include any offsite water contributions? It includes offsite. Anything that flows uh, into that outfall. Yep, thank you, Dewey. And then the idea there is that water could be flowing across our disturbed area in the project and isn't going anywhere else, so it does need to be accounted for. Correct. You don't want to discount it because when you go to put, let's just say, a sediment basin in and you're only accounting for what's within the right of way, it'll be too small and it won't you know, filter correctly or it could blow out the dam itself. Okay, hey, we've got a question about total project area. What about the case when you're only widening to one side of the road? Is the total project area still measured from right of way to right of way? I would say yes to, to that if anybody wants to push back on that answer. And that's the kind of a typical GDOT convention is that our total project area is, is from whatever we're, we're calling begin and end project lengthwise and then includes the, the right of way with width wise. That's always been my understanding, but again, I'll let you guys comment if need be. And I am seeing a couple questions about sediment basin accessibility and some cross hatching things. I think those are probably best addressed by GDOT um, in the formal written responses and for us to consider maybe further clarifying certain things uh, in our PPG. Another question about disturbed area, should the existing bridge being be counted as disturbed area on a project, sorry, on a bridge replacement project? I, uh, not sure I totally understand that question. However, disturbed area is basically land disturbing. So if you're demolishing a bridge and you're not disturbing land because the bridge is in the air, I would say no, unless you're talking about, you know, the in rolls and, and you know areas like that that's associated with it. Thank you, Dewey. I would agree. OK, Robert, at this point, I'm not seeing any further questions that would benefit the large group here. Um, but if you haven't heard your question asked, please don't don't worry. Uh, we've got them. We've got a record of them all and we will uh, provide responses to them. So I'll keep my eye on on the Q&A in case any more come in. But I think at this point, we're probably ready to start with any closing remarks. So, Sam, can I just jump in right quick? Of course. It, it looks like a new question's been asked. And it says, is Dewey saying that previous stage hatching is to be shown in the subsequent stages phases grade back? And no, that, that's not what I'm saying. Um, if you're doing the uh, construction activity without hatching, um, active construction should be in bold then in subsequent stages that should be faded back when you do the hatching option according to the ppg you only show hatching in the active and then you remove you don't show the hatching in subsequent stages the example i was giving is that when you do that when you show the hatching in the active and then you go into the subsequent stage and you, you no longer are showing that hatching but then you have proposed ditches, cut and fill lines in bold, and that conflicts with the main rule of the bold versus faded, that, that's where you come into issues. So no, when you're doing hatching, 
only the active shows hatching and in subsequent stages according to the PPG you're not supposed to show hatching at all. Great, thank you Dewey. OK. I think uh, we're closing in on our two hours and we still have about 10 minutes. See if anything else comes in in the chat. And while we're uh, waiting to see if any additional questions come in, I'll just want to reiterate to everyone uh, you know, what we kind of talked about today. The, the high level issues is just you know, we want to improve the quality of the plan set that's being submitted to EPD. And the way that we're going to get there is to ensuring that we have good quality control throughout the design process, uh, making sure we have qualified level two design professionals that are preparing these plans, making sure that we have qualified level two design professionals that review the plans and uh, ensuring that those comments and things can be implemented in time uh, making sure that you know we, we have these tools. We have lots of guidance documents. We have these QA forms available. There's a lot of information that's available to ensure we've got the outfall location guidance document. There's a lot of documents out there and information that's available to designers and practitioners to make sure that we have good quality plans submitted. Uh, so you know those resources are there. Please you know make a point to use those resources. And then, the, of course, the final thing that we talked about is, you know, don't be afraid to ask if there's uh, a concern you're not sure, because there are a lot of things on these projects that are design related problems that aren't probably, you know, clarified sometimes in our guidance documents. Uh, we understand that EPD understands that if you ask Dewey, he'll say, yeah, definitely, you know, reach out and ask a question uh, if you have a design specific problem or if you have a question with the guidance itself, you're not sure about the guidance. I would ask that, you know, we go through our Office of Design policy that uh, Christopher Rudd mentioned earlier in our presentation. We have a resource that's available, Lewis, uh, you know, reach out to him with questions or Brad McManus is also available in his office. And if you can't get answers through those two different resources with GDOT, then of course our EPD reviewers are available also. Uh, for discussions and to kind of work through specific problems. And that goes also for the responses. So when you do get a review letter back, uh, if you are questioning any of those comments that you got from EPD, it definitely is warranted time to have a quick sit down uh, teams presentation with them just to look at the issue online and kind of work through the problem. They're, they're readily available. OK, uh, do we have any other questions that came in that we'd like to respond to now? There is one that might have value for the group. Um, when including large offsite, because a follow up question for the question about does offsite water flowing into the site need to be included in that outfall drainage area? So when including large offsite contributions to our outfall basins, a lot of times we don't meet sediment storage requirements. How do we address this concern? uh basically that's talked about in checklist item 49 um whenever you do your uh basins and you do your calculations and stuff like that you know all that's to put in as many bmps as you can to try to meet that requirement and if you can't meet that requirement what you do is is you put a risk a written justification in the plan for that outfall and say basically that the storage requirement wasn't met and you basically just give justifications as to why you can't put additional BMPs in that basin to meet that requirement, like lack of right of way or ESAs, things of that nature. Thank you, Dewey. about one last question 
Uh, does the level two plan preparer need to be the one to submit questions to EPD or can those assisting the plan preparer submit those questions? I mean, any, anybody can ask us questions and it's not <laughs> just me. Uh, just to let you know, I just do the south part of the state. So if you're uh, going to do anything in the north part of the state, RJ Hunter, um, is the one you would need to speak with because I don't want to speak, you know, for her if it's project specific things, but if it's just general stuff, I mean, you can, you know, contact me even if it's in her area and vice versa. And then we have a new person coming on um, their own. They just have to go through everything uh, first before they actually start reviewing plan so there'll be three of us eventually but for right now i do the south part of the state rj does the north part of the state and it doesn't matter who it is anybody's got a question y'all can contact us but just keep in mind though you guys are many we are few so you know if y'all bombard us with a whole bunch of questions it might take us a while to get back with you yeah and thank you julie for that and, and let me just reiterate to everyone you know we would prefer that you work those questions and concerns through the Office of Design Policy and Support through the contact of Lewis. Uh, and the reason behind that is, is we're trying to identify additional things that, you know, we should develop uh, more guidance documents uh, to address. So if we're not involved in those questions and hearing some of those concerns, uh, we won't necessarily know, you know what we need to look at for another guidance document. You know, just for example, we mentioned the outfall location uh, document. You know, that document was put together. It's not finalized by any means. So if, you know, as practitioners, if you use that document and you find a scenario that's not addressed in that guidance, you know, we would love to hear that because uh, that's something that we could further clarify and uh, get included into our guidance information. So please, questions we would prefer, you know, go through design policy and support first, and then uh, if we have to go to the reviewers with EPD, that would be the next step. Now, of course, if you get a specific comment that you need to discuss, that's a different scenario. And uh, as Dewey mentioned, you'll have the, the reviewer that's assigned to your project. You'll know who that is and who you can reach out to for questions. Okay, any other questions? We're down to three minutes left. I did just say that was the last one, but I just can't resist. Why is the sediment storage requirement based on total drainage area rather than disturbed area? Because the total area flows over the disturbed area. And once that nice clean water runs over your disturbed area, it is, uh, it is part of the water that needs to be accounted for in that outfall calculation. Exactly. Kind of like I was talking about before, it's to ensure adequate trapping efficiency. If you only size uh, your basin or only uh, provide BMPs uh, to do storage for the disturbed area, when you have a rain event, all that offsite water is going to be flowing through that drainage area. It'll just blow out everything. OK. Well, I want to say thanks again to all our panelists uh, for their involvement in putting this training together and the information that was provided. I'll open the floor real quick for any of our presenters that would like to make any closing comments or anything that you would like to mention before we sign off. 